Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Sean Acor. I'm the author of The Happiness Advantage and a happiness researcher. And I'm joined today by one of my good friends, Eric Karpinski, who has a new book coming out, Put Happiness to Work, which I'm so excited to have a conversation with him to get to have him highlight some of the amazing things that he's been researching and thinking about and delving into in this book. Um, just as a little bit of background, Eric and I have worked together for for years. Um, we've been bringing this positive psychology research out to organizations across the globe in more than 50 countries, working with nearly half the Fortune 100 companies. Eric has worked so, so deeply amidst the work we've been doing to bring positive psychology to schools and to hospitals and to these companies to really try and find a way of how do we not just do this research, but how do we bring it to life? So I really want to uh, let you get to hear from him today and to talk about this new book, Put Happiness to Work, which is being published by McGraw-Hill. And you know he has amazing endorsements You know, coming from my friend Adam Grant. We've got Michelle McQuaid, Dan and Pink, who are all uh, supporting the work that you're doing, Eric. Eric was a, uh, uh, a trained as a scientist at, at Brown and then uh, went off and got an MBA from the Wharton School as well. So he knows what he's doing. And uh, so uh, first of all, let me just say uh, welcome, Eric. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sean. Really, really appreciate uh, a chance to just have a, a casual conversation together. Yeah, this is great. So I think uh, I think the first important thing for an author you know, to, to share is like, what, wh why, why did you write this book? Like, it's such an undertaking to write a book. Why did you take time away from family and going out and sharing the research to, to write this book? Yeah, it's, it's been fun. I've been really working in this space for, gosh, 11, 12 years now, teaching and speaking about all the amazing research, all the amazing positive psychology research, all the neuroscience research. And, you know, those first few years, it was just like all I could do to, like, Hey, this is cool. Come look at this. Hey, this is cool. Come look at this. But over the years, having worked with a lot of clients, being in the trenches, figuring out what it takes to really make the transformation and, and switch a culture over, um, there's a lot of things that, that I've learned that I wanted to pull together into a book. And it's been, you know, it, it's fun to keep track of the research along the way. But when you write a book, you like really dive deep into some, some of the research. And it's a great way for me to re-energize the science of research and, and then pull it together in a way that that can be really useful, really practical. Uh, and that's really what this book is about is how do we how do we help ourselves and our teams become happier? And then how do we leverage that to also reach the, the aggressive goals that we want to do and create more meaning and, and really have a um, and push things forward? I love that. And I, I think one of the things that you and I have both seen in the work we've been doing is that there's so many attempts to create positive change inside organizations. Some organizations don't even try, but then others try and they work so hard. And I think a lot of the people that are going to be really interested in your research, um, they try to create positive change in their organization, wherever they are in the structure. Um, but it seems like things get in the way. Maybe you could talk a little bit about from what you, you have in your book about how um, why do you think it is that a lot of these like employee engagement programs and these positive interventions haven't worked in the past? And how do we how do we move forward? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting when we start to talk about employee engagement. One of the challenges is that so many leaders focus on the benefits to the organization. Right. That if we get our teams engaged, they're going to be more productive. They're going to create more profits. They're going to give better customer service or or managers that sort of talk about engagement, they, they present it as, oh, what's going to be great if you guys are engaged because you'll be more loyal, you'll be more committed, you'll be more willing to, to, to put in discretionary effort and more willing to go the extra mile. But of course, when people hear that, they're, they're like, well, those are benefits that you get, but what's in it for me, right? And employees don't really care about their engagement. What they do care about, though, is their happiness. And so what's really interesting. And I think what's really important is to know that when people are engaged, they feel inspired. They feel proud of the work they're doing. They feel um, like they belong on a team, that they're part of something that's, that's doing something important. They feel that their work matters. And so if we can, essentially, they feel all of these activated, what I call activated positive emotions, right? So if we can change how we think about engagement, and how we talk about engagement, not as the benefits that the organization or the team is going to get as a macro, but, but what are the benefits to each of us separately? If we can focus less on the outcomes and more on, on 
people feeling those activated positive emotions. Because we all want to feel inspired. We all want to feel happy. We all want to feel like we matter. So what's neat is if we can, once we make that shift from engagement equals profitability to engagement is actually driven by activated positive emotions, now we get everybody aligned. Everybody's pulling together in the same direction, right? Because we all want to be happy. Managers, leaders, as well as, as our sort of individual contributors all want to be happy. And if we do happiness in the right way, if we, we choose certain strategies that are going to increase certain positive activated, um, activated positive emotions, now we're also going to get engagement. And so we're going to reach those productivity and those profitability metrics. But we're not just saying you need to be productive. We're saying we want you to be happy. And if you do, we're also going to, we're all going to benefit because we're going to, the company and the organization is going to do great. And we're all, gonna, we're all going to actually enjoy coming to work. <clears throat> and the thing that I really like about your book is the so research and evidence-based, right? Because I think people are oftentimes feel like happiness sounds soft, but engagement sounds tough or corporate. Yeah. But I think you're absolutely right. People are starving for happiness. They want to talk about happiness. I think oftentimes that when we use that softer language, because happiness sounds too ambitious at organization, mm -hmm. we miss out on what actually motivates people. And you describe that so well in, in your book. One of the things I, I'd love for you to, to describe to, um, to everyone watching is, you know, I, you, you actually specified that there's a couple types of people that you really want to target as you're trying to create these positive changes. Um, maybe you could go into describing uh, uh, that process. Yeah, for sure. So um, when I think about this work, there's, there's sort of two major groups of, of folks in organizations that, that I think that the, the strategies in this book are gonna be most helpful for. The first is just the group that Gallup calls not engaged. Right, and this is 52% of U.S. Um, employees and 67% of workers worldwide. And the the challenge with that group is that they're they don't have they don't feel a lot of activated positive emotions, right? They maybe feel bored or a little apathetic on the negative side, or they could even feel good. They could feel content or kind of satisfied, like oh yeah, yeah, the job's pretty good. But it's those are kind of rest and digest kind of positive emotions where yeah, I feel good but that's not terribly motivated, right? It's not a very motivating thing to feel. So if we can um, instead focus on finding ways to increase the amount of activated and positive emotions that those people feel, and this is through strategies like, let's really work on authentic appreciation so that people feel that their work matters. And I know a lot of people say, oh, well, yeah, well, we're already doing that. <laughs> There's some amazing studies that say 80% of leaders think everyone's getting appreciated, uh, but only 22% of, of individual contributors are actually agree that their peers are getting appreciated, at least I think it was once a month. Um, so while we, we, we think we're doing it, it's not landing. And so a, a big strategy there is how do we really help people let it land that their work matters and, and what the things are that they're contributing? There's also a strategy about social connection. How do we help people feel like they belong? How do we help them know each other and understand um, what the other people are going through and then really connect? Things about strengths. There's a whole strategy around meaning. How do we find meaning in the work we do? How do we help um, see that what we do isn't just for us, but also helps? Maybe it's our coworkers. Maybe it's a product that really helps people. Whatever it is, we, gotta, we can each individually find, individually find meaning. And what that does is it really helps drive a lot of positive emotions for those people that are that are not engaged right now. They're just kind of like floating along. They're like, all right, hey, it's fine. But if we can engage them in these activities, now they're starting to, to feel like they're part of the team. They start to feel that what they're doing matters. And that drives engagement. Um, and I actually, I want to I say, I've got a, a sort of a theme that goes through the book. Sean, as you know, there's so much wonderful research out there, so many tools and things that we can use to help people organize, organize and be happier at work and in life. So I like to think of this, and this is particularly important for this not engaged group. We've got, we, we, I call it the action buffet. So we've got this huge, think of this smorgasbord. I mean, it's going to be a long time before we actually go back to a place where there's a big buffet. But let's pretend we can remember more than a year ago when there was a big buffet. And you could 
essentially all the research says, here are things that work, that we know work for a, a group, a good group of people. So read through them, decide which ones sound most interesting to you. Which ones do you think would fit for your team? And then take a little sample, take a little helping, try it out for a couple meetings in a row or, or try it out for yourself for a couple days in a row. And just, does that feel like it's good? By the way, you can't just do it once. Like anything, any of these things are going to be a little awkward the first couple of times you do it. So go through, try it a few times, but if it doesn't work, that's okay. There's so many more options that we can go back to. But if it does work, now there's the magic. Because a lot of these things are in, in, in the form of habits, ways that we can do something in a regular way so that we actually rewire and hardwire ourselves and our teams so that we can more often plant those little seeds, right? That we're, we're planting seeds and creating space for potential happiness and potential positive emotions. Um, and that's a, that's a great way to go. So the action buffet, that's all sort of in the non, um, <clears throat> in the not engaged kind of folks. Then the other group that I want to address is really the group that's overwhelmed, right? They, they feel lots of activated emotions, but they tend to be very negative. You know, they're full of stress or they're full of, of frustration and anger or, or just irritation. And this group often have a lot of energy, but they often waste that energy on sort of non-productive activities, trying to avoid their stress or manage their stress or, or those negative emotions. So we still end up with a poor performance, even though there's lots of things happening there, lots of stress. Oh my God, I have to stay late and I have to do all the things. Um, and there, you know, several of the strategies that are more on positive focus, like social connection, like <clears throat> strengths, like coaching, are all really helpful to sort of provide resources to those people so that they're better able to address all of the, the demands on them. And then there's two strategies in the book that are really about how do we utilize the energy in our stress in one case, and how do we work through the negative emotions that we feel, right? How do we, what are the negative emotions we actually, we actually need to let in in order to live our lives in a real way? And which are the ones that, oh, that, that's just stuff in our head. We can probably get rid of that. So, so there's a lot of, there's some really proactive things we can do, tools we can use to address those folks that are overwhelmed. And I think that that group has gotten bigger and bigger over the course of this last year as, as we're lonelier and more stressed, et cetera. So maybe you could uh, conclude with talking about that. Um, we've, you and I've been talking in the midst of the challenges that we've both experienced and that the world's experienced in the midst of 2020 and the pandemic. Uh, so I think people, I think your book's coming out actually at the perfect time. I think people need to find some way of being able to put happiness back into their life and put it back yeah. into work. So um, maybe you could leave us with two very practical tips, maybe that we could even start doing today. Um, tips makes it sound small. Two things that we could do in our life that you think would really move the needle. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're in this unprecedented challenge, right? And there's so much loneliness out there. There's so much stress. There's so much unhappiness. People are hurting. And I think so many of our leaders, I just keep hearing this over and over that, well, in two months, we're gonna, we're gonna be through this. And then we, can, then we can start doing these proactive things. Like, right, it's been a year of, oh, well, two months from now, it's all gonna be back to somewhat normal or some new normal. And that's, Guess what? It's even with the vaccine, it's gonna, it's not two months away where we get back to some of these things. It's gonna take time. So what, what I, I think the biggest thing I want to do is do something now because our people are hurting and we need to address it now, not keep waiting, keep keeping ourselves in this holding pattern. And then I think two specific things. I think the loneliness is such a problem. Work is one of the few places that we actually are still interacting with people. Yeah, it's often on online or it's often on Zoom, but there's so many opportunities we have because we've been robbed of so many of our personal relationships, um, our, our, you know, our churches and our communities and so many of it is harder. Work is for a lot of people, the only way, they, the only place they inter in, in, interact with people. So I wanna say we, we really, and social connection is the number one driver of happiness, right? So we need to figure out just little ways that we can add a little bit of ways to connect with each other. So some of my favorites, <clears throat> you know, when we're doing Zoom, we've got this photo background, this virtual background. 
just the day ahead of time, say, hey, I want everybody tomorrow as your virtual background to put some photo up that makes you happy, right? Just something, anything, it can be anything, anything that's safe for work. <laughs> and put it up there and, and share it with people. And, and you'll each get a few, you know, just, you know, 10 seconds to just sort of share what it is and, and what the activity is. It does, so it doesn't have to take a long time, but you can start to make connections with people. There's, you know, there's so many icebreaker questions that we could spend five minutes at the beginning of a meeting going around, either going around the room or if it's a really big room, send people into little breakout groups of two or three where they answer a question about, hey, what are you look, most looking forward to post COVID? Or what's one kind thing you've seen someone do this week? Um, anything, anything that can just help get us out of the work, work, work mindset and then help us learn a little bit more. And then my favorite idea, this is a, a idea from Scott Crabtree, who's a, a, a happiness speaker up in Port, uh, around the Portland area. He calls it a Pecha Kucha presentation. Now the name doesn't matter, but let me describe what, what it is. Essentially, you tell your whole team, all right, I want everybody to pull 10 photos about your life. That's that, well, just 10 photos about your life. Okay. And I want you to, the first five minutes of each meeting, the next you know, six or seven t team meetings, we're going to spend five minutes and I'm going to want you to do, and here's the rules on the Pecha Kucha. You, you set it up where you put the photos all in the presentation. You've only got 10 seconds to, through each photo. And you, so it's not much time. You can't tell a whole long story. You can't tell anything really complicated, but you can just land and share. This is, this is my dog, Ralph. I've had him for five years. This is me and my bees. I'm a beekeeper. And this is, uh, this is one of my passions. Right. And what it does, and you can't put any words on the slides. It's just the photo and you just 10 seconds. So in two minutes, you've now shared with the team. And the idea isn't to tell all the stories. The idea is to plant, again, plant seeds. And someone's going to reach out to you and be like, I didn't know you were a beekeeper. I've been thinking about getting bees myself. Right. And you create all of these offline connections between people by just throwing up 10 slides, 10 little photos and, and making it happen. I, I love it. I've actually done it with a couple groups um, that I've worked with. And it's, it's just, it, you just don't know, right? Because these people are working, you've been working for them for years. And you didn't know that they were, that they were a bassist in a band that plays, you know, on Saturday nights, at, well, used to play on Saturday nights at a, <laughs> at a bar. So that's my first one is there are lots of things we can do to be proactive right now. Utilize those Zoom meetings when we get together and actually are with people. There's so many things you can do that's in the book um, and that are just general ideas. The second one is a, lot, a little more serious. Um, and that's one, there's, there's so much pain right now, as we were talking about. As a leader, I think it's essential that we go on a listening tour. You know, we've been hearing, you know, some of us, we've been hearing hard times that people, some of our people are going through or whatever else, and we may have been addressing them. But to ask those that maybe are a little quieter about it, and just have just set some time with each person because people are hurting and we need to know how. So asking real questions like, how are you really doing? Now, it's important not to force anybody to share things if they don't want to, right? This is a work environment. So it's not a have to situation, but create the space where people can say, yeah, this has been really tough and here's, here's what's going on. Ask them what they're doing, like ask them what they need. Ask how you can help. And there's, there's just, some, just some clues about deep listening. Don't feel like you have to fix everything, but just create a space where you can listen and then go wait now. If there's some resource that's obviously going to help them, let them know right then. But in general, listen, repeat back what you're hearing. And then over time, you'll get the themes. You'll get some themes from your team and you'll find out. And then there, there might be um, specific programs you could implement to try to address what some of those are. But this is a time to listen and figure out what, how people are suffering and how we can potentially as an organization or as a team address some of those issues or just be listened to sometimes is all people need to sort of be able to move on. So yeah, so those are the two major areas of social and then just to do a listening tour and find out what's going on with people. I love those. We've actually been incorporating that, you know, after reading your book and, and putting it into our life. I mean, I have a, a Lego from my son built here right behind me. And um, I, I talk <laughs> about it in every single talk because people always ask about it. Right. So it just adds in this. I smile even thinking about it, even though I've talked about that probably 100 times. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that, that listening to is so important. So I think that was the thing I loved most about your book is that 
when I got to those really practical things, I was like, I can do this. Um, but also you paired it with this idea that I can do this, but actually it doesn't sound soft. It's not like I'm putting a Lego in my background and like now the world's gonna change, but actually putting that Lego in the background, when we do research and looking at how people actually process the world and how optimism impacts their business outcomes and how their social connection, and that's the greatest predictor of a team success rate, suddenly yeah. we see a dramatic and research-based connection in your book between these practical ideas we can't wait to do with our families and these outcomes that we think are gonna be happening in the world that we're doing for the right reasons, like you mentioned, is for happiness, but also have all these ancillary benefits like helping us make this a better world for all of us. So I wanted to thank you for your book. Um, and I want everyone you know, who are, is watching this, I don't want him to tell too many of the, the strategies in there because uh, spoiler alerts, right? Like we want people to, to, but there's so much in the book, we couldn't even cover it in this se uh, session. So um, the book is called Put Happiness to Work. This was Eric Karpinski, who's been doing amazing research and can continue to do so. And Eric, thank you so much for, for joining me today. Sean, thanks so much. Um, I really appreciate having worked with you, having seen how much emphasis you put on how, how many lives you've touched with all the work you do with the Happiness Advantage. And, and I love the, his more recent book called Big Potential, um, which is all about how do we create teams and social connection. Um, so check those out too. And, uh, and if you want to purchase a copy of my book right now, though, if you go to the website, put happiness to work.com. So that's put happiness to work.com is, uh, you can buy it right then. And it's going to be coming out here in another uh, week or two. So it's, it's coming right up. All right, Sean, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. All Have right. a great day. Bye -bye.